talking about character encodings, we got to UTF-8 and we saw, we saw that UTF-8 is a character encoding that can use up to four bytes and can encode any character you can think of. Any, any character that we need, the, uh, I believe UTF-8, I'm, I'm quite certain, that the entire UTF-8 space isn't fully filled yet. There's constantly new characters being added. There's tons of space for everything to fit in there. So it's a very nice protocol. The important thing for our purposes is to know that it can use up to four bytes for a single character. It's very, very important when computing our content length. Content length is the number of bytes being sent, not the length of your string. That's our big takeaway for UTF-8. We need to set content length equal to the number of bytes being sent. You might have one single character that's four bytes, your content length is four. Uh, and, and also the structure, there's a very specific structure to UTF-8 encoding. So if we have text encoded with UTF-8, it has to follow this structure. If you have bytes that are not encoded as UTF-8 text or ASCII text, and you try to decode it as UTF-8, things break. So specifically when you're sending an image of a dog over the internet, which you'll do in homework one, that's not going to work if you ever convert that image into UTF-8 because it's not UTF-8. It's going to be bytes, there's going to be ones and zeros and groups of eight, sure, but they're not going to follow this exact structure, which means you'll have decoding errors. We don't wanna do that. And in Python, you'll see these two methods, encode and decode. We use these a lot. You'll, you'll start using these right away. It's one of the first things you have to do when you start programming your homework. So encode, whenever we have a string, which the internet does not understand, the internet only understands ones and zeros. If we have a string, we need to encode it into bytes using UTF-8 or decode it as bytes, when we're reading from the TCP stream, we're going to decode the bytes into a Python string uh, or any language specific string. So we are going to encode using UTF-8 and send just the bytes over the internet. And then whoever's reading the, those bytes, maybe JavaScript on the other side or the browser, they're not going to understand what a Python string is. So they're going to decode our bytes because we didn't send a string, we sent bytes. We're going to decode the, they're going to decode the bytes and get back to that original string that we were sending. Python's encode and decode method, I added a slide on actually. Python's encode and decode method, uh, we can just call these. The default for each of these is UTF-8. You can, for what it's worth, specify the encoding if you'd like. But if you're uh, using UTF-8 or ASCII, which is a subset of UTF-8, just use encode and decode with no parameters, or sorry, no arguments, you'll be fine. Uh, it'll use UTF-8 as the encoding. So encode and decode, if you've done any coding where you've needed to call those where everything broke, if you slapped an encode or decode and then everything worked great, that's why it's converting from language specific string to bytes and vice versa. Uh, and that's why we don't have to think too much about the encoding. You're never going to have to manually encode or decode something but that's why those methods need to be called because that's what's doing the encoding, so you don't have to. So content length, the number of bytes. I can't say this enough. Some of you will still come to office hours with this issue, which you probably just forgot, but, uh, uh, which is fine. But content length is the number of bytes in the body of the request, uh, response or request when it's a post request. Uh, we'll get to those. But content length is the number of Bytes, 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 bytes. I can't say this enough. Uh, number of bytes. Because uh, everybody used to make that mistake, so I'm like, I better say that like 20 times in lecture so nobody makes this mistake. Uh, it's the number of bytes in the body. So uh, if you have a string and it has non-ASCII UTF-8 characters that have more than one byte per character and you're setting your content length to the length of the string, if you have some string you're sending, you do len of that string to get your content length and then do dot encode right before you send it over the socket, that's going to be the wrong content length. You're gonna have bugs, things are gonna break. Uh, you should, the way I set up the homework, you'll get a JavaScript error uh, where the JavaScript won't run. You won't have that line from JavaScript on the front page because you won't have the closing brace of your JavaScript code and then uh, it won't, uh, the syntax isn't right. you get syntax errors. 
So content length is the number of bytes. Uh, content length is always number of bytes, but that's important when it's UTF-8. You do have to be careful. Take the length after converting to bytes. Oh, okay. So that's, uh, I think we, we got through like at least most of that, but I wanted to reemphasize those couple of points because they're really important. Um, but now let's talk about MIME types. We definitely didn't get to this last time. MIME types, so when we send information over the internet, how does the receiver know how to interpret that information? It's just ones and zeros. So how do we actually say, oh, these ones and zeros, this is what it means? Well, MIME types, that's how we're gonna do it. And we have a pretty big restriction in that the, I don't, I don't know what I'm pointing to, but we have a pretty big restriction in that the headers of an HTTP request can only be ASCII, but that doesn't mean we can only send ASCII over the internet. That would be pretty limiting. You use the internet before you know it's not just text that we can access. Um, so it's not just ASCII that we can send, but we need to, in those headers, tell somebody how to read the body of the message, because the body can be any bytes ever. Anything we can uh, encode in bytes, we can send in the body of a, um, a response or a request when it's post request. And we need the headers to be able to say what that type is, and we're going to do that through the content type header. Oh, I can't highlight, come on. Some slides let me and some slides don't. I don't know what I do different in some of them. But content type header is going to specify the MIME type, and that's how uh, the receiver is going to know how to interpret those bytes. So content length, how many bytes need to be read? Content type, how do I decode these bytes? What do these bytes actually represent? MIME type comes from multi-purpose internet mail extension. It's a very old extension. When email was first being created, they really use it for email, and we adopted it for HTTP. The HTTP crew said, you know what, that's a really cool uh, way of specifying data. We're gonna steal that and start using it. Uh, so it's used for more than just email these days. Uh, MIME types are a type, see I can highlight on this slide, a type and a subtype separated by a slash in common types, ignoring the subtype for now. Text, we've already seen this uh, in my hello, basically hello world. I should just change that to hello world in the other example, but hello example from last time. Uh, we see text, image and video, also very valid types. And putting a type with a subtype, here are some of the common ones we're going to see in uh, throughout this semester. Text slash plain is the one that we saw for the hello example. Text slash HTML, if you're sending your HTML on your uh, root path, text slash HTML should be your MIME type. Text slash CSS, text slash JavaScript for your CSS and JavaScript respectively. Uh, image slash PNG, image slash JPEG, video dot, uh, slash MP4. And the one kind of oddball that we just have to remember, it's not text slash JSON, it's application slash JSON um, for reasons. It's because JSON was a newer format, and when JSON came around, they realized that it should have the application type, and if we could go back and rename, uh, redo all these, these would all be application as well. But when JavaScript came around, these are already fixed, we can't change those now. Uh, but when JSON came around, we said, you know what, we're gonna fix that mistake at least for one thing, so that's why JSON is a very commonly used one that's application instead of text, for what it's worth. Uh, a little background on that one. Uh, so application JSON, which we'll start using in homework two. We guys use application JSON when we're sending JSON. You ask people in the back to stop talking. Uh, are they still talking? At, at 309, I couldn't even hear anyone in the back talking a minute ago. I thought y'all shut up after a few minutes in. <laughs> I'll be on a lookout. I'll find them and, and hunt them down. Y'all are loud at the beginning, but y'all settle down really good, but I'll watch out for it. Yeah, if you're in the back talking, shut up. <laughs> Which, I don't want to talk about it too long, but like, you're, you're adults and you've been in college for a while. Like, if you want to talk during class, like, just don't come to class. Like, I'm not really forcing you to be here. I, I never understood that, why, why people do that. I set up the lecture questions specifically that you need zero of them to get an A. Even if you're going for an A, if you know your stuff enough that you don't have to pay attention in class, you know, don't distract everyone else who, who does want to pay attention to lecture. Uh, I never understood that. Like, uh, I don't know. Anyway, so 
uh, your content type header can have extra content instead of just the type and subtype, this MIME type. We can have extra directives separated by a semicolon. And this is going to be necessary for your homework one code to work properly. There's an emoji in the HTML. There's an emoji in the JavaScript that gets added to the page. So when you load your home page after objective two, oh my goodness, I forgot what I labeled them as. Yeah, one's just parsing and two's hosting your site and then three's the cookie. Uh, objective two, after objective two, you should see two emojis on your page when it loads, when you go to localhost 8080. If you don't see both emojis, something went wrong. And if you see some really weird characters that look like errors on the screen, this is almost always what went wrong. That's the first thing I'm going to check in office hours. You come to me with um, everything looking pretty good, except the emojis are replaced by random-ish characters. Uh, this is what it's going to be. So you can add extra directives. If you, after your MIME type, add a semicolon. And then this is the important one for now, actually for the whole semester, is uh, charsa equals UTF-8. Exactly like that. It has to be exact. This is super particular. It has to be exactly like that. Uh, I've had countless, my, my mind goes to like, it's not literally countless infinity, but uh, I've had lots of office hour visits, uh, more, than, more than I remember, where uh, this is the issue. This, you look at it on the slides, you type it in your homework, and you type one character wrong, either it's an underscore here instead of a dash, it's a dash here instead of an equal sign, a colon here instead of a semicolon. Any one of those is enough to blow this apart and not work properly. So if you're having that issue where you see the wrong encoding, you're not getting those emojis showing up on your site properly, make sure this is character for character exactly what it needs to be. How many times somebody pulling their hair out, I've been working on this for hours, something's going wrong, the, the, I couldn't figure out what's going on, and I... Uh, in like two seconds, I look at this and I see an underscore, and then they're even more mad because it was something so silly. Uh, save yourself some time, double check that, make sure you have that char type, uh, char set exactly correct. Uh, and this will say, because your browser won't always default to UTF-8, like when you say it's a text type, I would like it for these, these days, I would like it to default to UTF-8. Uh, for some reason, I don't think any browser does. I don't know what it defaults to, but it doesn't work. Uh, so you have to tell it explicitly, use UTF-8, and then your UTF-8 non-ASCII characters are going to render properly. MIME type sniffing. I forgot I didn't get to this. I feel like I, I thought I covered this, but I think it's just in my head because I've been thinking about it. But uh, MIME type sniffing. So if you have the wrong MIME type for your content, Browsers these days, very sophisticated pieces of software, lots of you know, millions of lines, teams of professionals for decades have been working on this stuff, very sophisticated pieces of software. They, they will try to figure out your MIME type. If your MIME type is either missing or you have the wrong MIME type, there will be, uh, there will be an attempt by the browser to figure out what it is, and they call this MIME type sniffing. Do you have example of MIME type? I assume you said that before I did the slide. Uh, if that's still a question, let me know. Uh, all right, so MIME type sniffing is generally considered bad. This is bad. Uh, one big problem, sometimes browsers are gonna get this wrong. And sometimes you'll just have the flat out wrong MIME type in a really confusing way where there's no clear right answer. Like the browser can't even just get it wrong, but sometimes a browser will accidentally get it right. But the bigger issue is that browsers have different MIME type sniffing code. So maybe one browser gets it right and another browser gets it wrong. Now you test it in Chrome, it works fine in Chrome. Your users are using Firefox and it doesn't work. It doesn't work for them. And you say, I swear it works on my laptop, and your customers don't care. They, they never want to hear that. Uh, it, it worked for me. Um, don't rely on MIME type sniffing. Just don't rely on it. So, and this is best practice. If you go to websites and look at all the requests, a lot of times this will be disabled. 
and you can disable it through an HTTP header, which is required on homework one. X content type options colon no sniff. Set this header, and that tells the browser, look, I got my MIME types right. Don't sniff the, uh, the MIME types. Just use the MIME type I have. And if you have this header set and you have the wrong MIME type, the browser's gonna say, well, you told me not to figure out the MIME type, so I'm just not gonna. And then it'll give you an error, which for, for my money, I'd rather see that. Uh, it'll give you an error instead of trying to render the page anyway. So now that you have an error, you're gonna see that in testing. You can fix it, and then there is no bug to be released. But if you don't disable sniffing, you might never see that error. Your test browser will just kind of get it right, and then you release buggy code. We don't want to do that, so we're going to say, look, it, we know what our, we're doing. We're going to set the right MIME type. Don't try to help me out, browser. Yeah. I, I'm like 90% sure. I, I never tried it without that capitalization, but I'm pretty sure it's specific. And there's a bigger reason to disable this. Oh. Uh, there is a bigger reason, but here's a, another, another smaller reason. Um, just make sure you get your MIME types right. You don't want those surprises. Uh, this forces you to get your, I guess I kind of said that, but this forces you to get your MIME types right. Uh, for the homework, there's a secondary thing. I'm making sure you get your MIME types right. We're going to make sure that header set, oh, that, uh, this one caught me out, sorry. This one did catch me off guard. I, I added this on, uh, I think, Tuesday. And uh, forgot I added this slide, because I do want to emphasize this point. The slide's doing its job by reminding me to make sure I mention this. Make sure this header is actually set properly. When you're testing your homework, go into your browser console, open the console, and make sure it did actually parse this header. Way, way, way too many times have I seen students, which, I don't know, maybe like 10 times. I think that's way too many. Is, uh, a student will lose points for this one, and it will be... Um, uh, I forget what the TAs and I decided. I think we give a one for the objective, it, that we do this as a failed objective if you miss this header. Um, I believe is what we stuck with last semester. That's what I want to stick with this semester too. Make sure this header is actually set uh, properly. If you miss one character in this and it's not setting properly, you can see that in the browser console. So go to your console and actually check to see if this header was parsed properly to make sure that it actually shows up in your headers in your browser console. Uh, that's exactly what the TAs are going to do, and if it doesn't show up there, that is an issue. You're not going to pass that objective. Please, please just check this. I hate talking to students and saying, sorry, you lost your points because you, you missed a character here. I know it's frustrating, but if you don't have that header set properly, it, you might as well not set it at all. There's no reason to, to have this there if it's not set properly. The most common thing I see is having the header and having just a slash n instead of a slash r slash n. Without slash r slash n, it's treated as part of the previous header, part of the previous header's value, and it doesn't get parsed properly. So make sure this is actually being parsed properly when you're testing your homework. The big issue with this, the one I was setting up earlier, is this is an actual security concern too. Uh, that if this is relying on MIME type sniffing. If we're not disabling MIME type sniffing, which if your header's not set properly, you're not actually disabling it. And you have a site like we're gonna have in homework three where users can upload images to your site and those images are displayed to all other users. Now you're gonna set those images to the proper MIME type. If you're only supporting PNGs or as I allow in the homework, if you're only supporting JPEGs, then you're gonna set the MIME type to image slash JPEG and host those images to all of your other users. And you have a clever user who says, well, I'm not gonna upload an image, I'm gonna upload some JavaScript that blows up everybody's computers. And you have your MIME type set to image.png, but you don't disable sniffing. The browser gets this supposed image that you just sent to all your users, and the browser says, that's not the right MIME type. This is, this is JavaScript. I'm gonna run this as JavaScript and runs that JavaScript on everybody's machine. Now all of your users just got hacked and you have a, a really bad situation on your hands. But if you set this MIME type and tell the browser, hey, don't sniff out the MIME type, you're not gonna have that issue. It's gonna say, gee, this really looks like JavaScript, but you told me it's an image slash PNG, but you told me not to sniff 
the type, so I'm just going to give an error and not touch this at all, which is exactly what we want in that situation. So this does become a security concern. Solution, disable sniffing. Tell the browser to stop doing that. Cut that out. I'm skipping that slide. When we start getting post requests, uh, I moved post requests used to be part of homework one. Uh, I moved it later, so I don't feel like talking about that quite yet. But uh, when you're receiving post requests, they'll have the MIME type in the content type, just like when you're sending responses. So these will appear on the other side when we start doing that as well. Now, for objective two, you do also have to send images. So let's talk about this. How do we send an image over the internet? That's going to be really complex, huh? It's not, but. The no stiff needs to be set for every response we send. Kind of, most of them. Uh, for objective two, yes. For objective three, I don't think I put it in the objective three. You're just sending plain text, so I, I don't think I bothered adding it. Um, but whenever it says in the testing, uh, by the way, the testing, I don't think I said this during lecture yet, but the testing procedures, I have those for every objective. Uh, those testing procedures are exactly what the TA is going to follow when they grade your assignments. I don't give my TAs, aside from like giving them a heads up of certain situations and certain mistakes that come up pretty often, I don't give my TAs any extra special instructions when they're testing the code. Those tests and procedures are the same tests and procedures the TAs have. If those tests and procedures don't say, make sure they have their X content type, uh, frick, I don't even remember it off the top of my head, uh, type options, no sniff. If they don't have that, then you know that's part of the testing procedure. If it's not in the testing procedure, we're not testing it. Uh, you can put a lot of stock into those testing procedures. The idea is you follow those exactly, and if everything works well, unless you have like cross-browser compatibility issues, uh, which does happen quite often, if you have a bug, but kind of like what I was saying with the content type sniffing, you might have a bug where you changed your code until it worked in your specific development environment, but it's extremely fragile, broken code that doesn't work anywhere else on anyone else's machine. You know, things like that can happen. Uh, but if you're following the testing procedures, that's exactly what the TA is going to do. Uh, you can test exactly the way they're going to test. Uh, my recommendation is use, we're going to use Chrome and Firefox for testing. If you developed and did all your testing in Chrome, switch over to Firefox and test it again. If you did all your development in Firefox, switch to Chrome. Uh, if you have a third browser you like, you know, mix and match and make sure it works in different browsers. Uh, open it in an incognito window too, make sure it works there is a good, uh, good test. Uh, make sure you're not hard coded for your dev environment. It happens every semester, a lot of students do it, and they lose a lot of points. Sometimes they fail, uh, if it's too egregious. Not if it's too egregious, but like if they keep doing it. And, uh, you know what, I, I back myself in this corner, Let me, I'll say one specific thing that is, uh, drives me absolutely insane, is uh, shouldn't be an issue this semester, because I added objective one to homework one, where you have to parse your headers. But uh, I would see students hard coding their headers. They would take the headers, split on slash r slash n, and then say they need to read the cookie. They would access the value at index 17, because they know that's where the cookie header is going to be. Well, sure, in their test environment, maybe that it just happens to be at index 17, but it's not going to be at index 17 anywhere else ever. So some students do that all the way through the course even. I'd see on homework four, they'd still be doing that. That stuff drives me nuts. Those students usually fail because they just clearly didn't get what was happening. Um, but now I force you to parse your headers right from objective one of homework one. So, because I got so sick of seeing that issue uh, that I want to get rid of that. Nobody should be doing that at all. All right, so to send an image. Does it have to work in IE6? Um, honestly, with the protocols that we're using, it should. I mean, we're not using anything too fancy. I don't know if IE6 had WebSockets. It definitely didn't have web, uh, WebRTC, so some of the later things in the course wouldn't work. But at least at this point, we're using vanilla HTML, like basic stuff. It should work. I mean, we're not going to test it in IE6, but it should. Should. Um, so sending images. How do we send images? We're not sending text. We talked about text encodings this whole time, uh, but an image isn't text. 
So an image is going to be a sequence of bytes. We have a file that we read. It's going to be bytes, but it's not going to be encoded as UTF-8 or ASCII. It's going to be encoded as JPEG or PNG, well, JPEG for the homeworks. It's going to be encoded using that protocol. So how do we handle those bytes? Well, we read the bytes from the file. We can read a file as bytes. And then we just send those bytes. There are already bytes. And set the content length to the number of bytes you read. Read the bytes from the file. It'll be in a byte array. LEN, that byte array, that's your content length. And then ship it. Done. The bigger question is, how do we send strings? Sending strings was a whole conversation. And you have to hit it with that dot encode right at the end. You got your big string, and you hit it with dot encode to ship it over the TCP socket. The dot encode is what's taking your string and converting it into an array of bytes. But with your images, you go to the file and just read it as bytes. It's already an array of bytes. You don't have to do anything. So reading an image, sending an image over the internet, it is simpler, more straightforward than sending a string over the internet. Uh, the only thing is your headers will still be a string. So you have to combine a string with an image. So convert your headers to bytes using dot encode and then concatenate them together, which in Python is just the plus operator. We'll smash two byte arrays together and then ship that over the internet. So sending images, the most difficult thing, the, most, the biggest mistake I see with students sending images is overthinking it. Just don't overthink it. Read the thing from the file, get its length, ship it. Never, ever, ever convert that string that image to a string. This is what I mean when I say the UTF-8 encoding, it's a very strict, you know, it's, it's got to start with the number of ones and then a number of continuation bytes equal to the number of those ones and each continuation byte starts with one zero. It's a very structured format. When you read the bytes of an image encoded with JPEG or PNG, it's not necessarily, I mean, astronomical odds, maybe it just so happens to follow that structure, but it's never actually going to happen. Your image isn't going to have the correct structure to be able to be properly encoded as, or decoded as UTF-8 text. It's not going to happen. So if you take your image and try to encode it as a string, or decode it as a string, it's not going to work. It's going to corrupt the bytes, because Python has to do something. Either it's going to just crash flat out. It's going to say decoding error, or it's going to attempt to convert that to a string and get something that's wrong. And then when you take that string and try to convert it back to bytes, you're going to get valid UTF-8 bytes, which are not the bytes that you started with with that image. If you try to convert your image into a string, you're going to have a bad time. Your image is going to be corrupt, and everything's going to break. So you get your headers working. You convert your headers to a byte array, and then concatenate it with your image. Do not try to take your image, convert it to a string, concatenate, convert the them back to bytes and then ship it. That's not going to work. So don't overthink it. Read the bytes from the file and ship them. I don't know why I put PNG in the slides when uh, it's JPEG in the homework. Maybe to make you think about it for a second. Uh, how much stuff do I have open? And we're talking about cookies today, too. And once we talk about cookies, that's, uh, aside from Docker next week, that's everything you need to get the objectives done on your homework. Uh, and then next week, we'll get the Docker set up, which, honestly, I have a lot I want to say. I'll go through Docker and do demos and stuff like that. But when it comes to doing your homework, you basically cut and paste my Docker file and my Docker Compose file. I don't ask too much of you for that. Um, so once you get up to cookies, get the three objectives done without Docker, you're most of the way there for homework one. So HTTP is stateless. HTTP is stateless. This, I said it before. I'm saying it again. Um, but what does this mean to us? It means it's, it has no state. I don't know. But we often want state in our HTTP requests. Uh, uh, what that means is when we get a request, we only take what's in that request to be able to formulate our response. So we don't have this memory of a persistent connection with this user. Uh, we just get that request. And what's in that request is what we get to use 
for our response. That's it. But we often want state. Like for authentication, which we're going to use extensively in homework too. We want state. We want to remember this user. We want to get a request and say, okay, this request is from this user. I'm going to treat it as this user uh, and then let them do things that that user is allowed to do. If not, every single time you did anything on a site where you're logged in, where you need authentication, you'd have to send your username and password again. You'd send your request with username and password, type it in again, send it. Okay, this is that person. Okay, now I want to make a post. I want to say LOL to my friend. Okay, now I got to type in my username and password. It'd be a, a complete pain. So you all know where this is going. I'm sure you've dealt with this quite a bit in your lives. Uh, but we're going to use cookies to actually remember some information. We're going to kind of add a pseudo state to HTTP. Cookies is like adding state to HTTP, even though it's still not state, but we're going to kind of pretend it's state. What we do is set what's called a cookie, and that's going to give the user some information that they're going to very politely send back to us on every subsequent request. So we're going to set a cookie that tells their browser, hey, send this to me whenever you send me anything. And then every request after that is going to have that cookie. We can read the cookie and say, oh, yeah, I, I'm stateless, but I can read this cookie. So I, I must have set this at some point. And then you can treat that user as uh, you know, differently based on that information that they sent back in that cookie. So we're going to have them send us information back to us. But it's still stateless. It's still completely stateless. So if the user, say, modified that cookie, we'd have no way of knowing because we can't use any outside information. We just get that request. That request contains the cookie. And we say, well, if you got this cookie, I probably gave it to you, I guess. Cookies work through headers. So ASCII only. For what it's worth, cookies only ASCII characters in these things. We have two headers that we're going to use. And of course, for the homework, if you haven't looked at the homework doc, we're going to use this to have a visit counter. We're going to have a visit counting cookie. So when the user visits our site for the first time, we're going to see there's no cookie on their request. We're going to tell them to set a cookie with one as their visit count. And then if we get a request with that cookie set to X, we're going to set it to X plus one and send it back and then increment it every single time we get a request from that user. So we can remember how many times this user visited our page. Now, the user has full control over that. They can just change their cookie value to whatever they want. There's no security in this yet. Well, wait till homework two. We'll get some uh, authentication tokens and, and uh, some good security stuff. But this is how we're going to remember information about a user. This works completely through headers. Cookies work 100% through HTTP headers. There's two important headers, set cookie. That's us sending in a response the set cookie header to say, set this cookie. And then the browser is going to remember that cookie. And then the cookie header, which is when we receive a request, uh, the cookie, bless you, the cookie header is going to have all of the cookies that we told them to set. So let's look at the format of these two things. Set cookie is going to be a key value pair that allows us to set a cookie with this key as the name and then the value as the value. So if I want to set their visit counter to four, I'm going to send them a set cookie header with the value visits equals four. And the browser is going to know what to do with that and set a cookie named visits with the value four. You can only set one cookie with this header. You're limited to one cookie. You put a set cookie header. You can set one cookie with that header. But you can, sometimes you do want to set multiple cookies. You can actually have, and this is where homework one breaks down just a little bit, you can actually have multiple headers with the same name. So if you want to set two cookies, you set two headers, both with the name set cookie. You can have duplicate headers with the same name, and they'll be treated as multiple headers. Uh, so the homework one, uh, objective one code does break down a little bit because the code, I don't expect you to code that. If you want to, by the way, knock yourself out. You can do this uh, and handle things like this. Uh, we won't ever have a situation in this class where you'll get a request that's going to have multiple headers with the same name, but you will send responses with multiple headers with the same name, specifically set cookie. So you can have multiple headers with the same name. It is allowed by the protocol. HTTP does allow that. Uh, so our header parsing code, I thought about it like, do I really want them to have 
a dictionary that maps strings to lists, and the lists are almost always going to have one value in them, what will always have one value in them for our purposes, uh, I decided not to. Maybe in the future I'll, I'll make the class do it, but y'all don't have to. All right, so when we're setting a cookie, oh, but when we're getting the cookies, sorry, we're going to get it in this format. We're going to get the cookie header, and this will be just one header for every cookie. And there's an important reason why that these are different, and uh, you know, I got a few more slides here. I'll explain why. But the cookie header, when we receive the cookies, is just the cookie, uh, cookie as the name, and then a semicolon separated list of key value pairs for all of the cookies. This is how it's going to look when we read a request that contains cookies. Uh, so this is, uh, there's only one cookie so far, you'll just have your visit counting cookie, but you do have to parse this, get that value, read this value as an int, increment it by one, and then set the set cookie header in your response to that value plus one, and send it back. If you try to set cookie, if you use set cookie with a cookie name that has already been set, it will override the value. So if you get visits equals four in cookie, and you want to set it to five, you would do set cookie visits equals five to set it to the higher value, and it'll overwrite that four. I used to get that question in office hours a lot, so hopefully that, uh, I remember to mention it in lecture now, hopefully that answers that one. Uh, you can add directives. This is why you can only set one cookie with the set cookie header, is because we can add optional directives to our cookie to give more information than just the name and value of the cookie. Uh, this is why we can't set multiple cookies, because does a semicolon mean you want to set another cookie, or does it mean you want to add directives to this current cookie that you're setting? Uh, I don't know. So you just can't set more than one with one header. These directives are expires is the first one. So this will give extra information associated with our cookie. Expires gives an exact time when this cookie should expire. When a cookie expires, nothing magical happens, but the browser, as long as it's coded the way it's supposed to, which any uh, mainstream browser is going to be, will always set this cookie header in every request until this exact time, and after this time passes, it's just not going to send that cookie anymore, and it should delete the cookie from the user's browser as well. Uh, now, if the user wrote that cookie down or something, copied it into Notepad, something like that, they can still have access to that cookie. It doesn't actually get obliterated or anything. Um, but this is when request will stop sending that cookie back to the server. It has to follow this exact format. It has to be exactly like this. If you don't like that one, which I, I don't really like uh, the expires header because you got to do this exact format, and usually... What I'm trying to do is say, hey, uh, this cookie should last for this amount of time. And I'm going to generate that date stamp by taking today's, the current date time stamp, and then adding that elapsed time to it. And then, you know, it's just a lot of work. Unless there's some reason there's a specific date I need. Instead, we're going to use max age. For my money, is more useful. Max age is the number of seconds that should elapse before the cookie expires. And this is the one I, of course, recommend to use on your homework. This is the amount of time in seconds that should expire before the cookie uh, elapses before the cookie expires. So max age 3600 means set this cookie, and then after one hour, stop sending this cookie in future requests. These expires or max age are important because if neither of them are set, if you don't set expires or max age, which are the only two ways to have a cookie expire at a time that you choose, if neither of them are set, you're going to get what's called a session cookie, which is going to last until the user closes their browser. Now, note browser, not tab. If they close a tab but leave the browser open, uh, it's not going to erase that cookie. So it's dependent on when they close their browser, which isn't something that we can control as server developers, as web app developers. We can't control that, so it's usually not what we want. 
But uh, if you do have a reason for that, just don't set either expires nor max age, and that's the functionality you'll get. For the homework, you can't use session tokens. It says it in the, the objective three. I explained that. Uh, no uh, no session, uh, session cookies. There's a few more directives. Uh, I don't think I specified any of these in, in objective three. Uh, just the just the max age, if you set max age to 3,600. Uh, but I do want to talk about the other ones because we'll use some of these in uh, homework two. But the secure directive, this means only send the cookie using HTTPS. So this isn't something that we're using yet in the course. We won't even use HTTPS until homework four. And I don't think I'll revisit cookies at homework four, so we probably won't use this one. But you'll see this out in the wild. The secure directive means only send it over encrypted channels, only send it over HTTPS. So if you have an HTTP connected a connection and a secure cookie, that cookie will not be sent as long as the browser is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So you know, some browsers, it's up to the client. Uh, the client might have some plugin to their browser that removes this restriction and sends the cookie anyway. Users can do whatever they want. This is, we made it to the end of week two, and this is the first time I'll, I'll be saying this, but never trust your users. You're going to hear me say that a lot. Never trust your users. They can do all kinds of wacky things. Uh, don't trust them. So they could edit their browser code, you know, com recompile from source, like recompile Firefox from source and remove this functionality. I mean, people won't do that just to screw themselves over. But uh, when we start talking about more security stuff, never trust your users because they can do a lot of wacky things to try to throw you off, uh, catch you off guard and break shit. Don't trust them. Uh, and we set the directive like this. HTTP only. This is a very important directive for a lot of reasons. Uh, this is going to prevent the cookie from being read using JavaScript. So if somebody has an attack script, they somehow inject JavaScript into your user's machine, and that JavaScript is trying to read their cookies, using document.cookies, which will display all your cookies, it will not display the HTTP only cookies. Now, the users can still see their cookies. They'll show, still show up in the browser console. You can go look at your cookies, even if they're HTTP only, if you're on your device, but you can't access them through JavaScript. So it's a lot more difficult for an attacker to read these cookies or modify these cookies or anything that you want to do with them using scripts. Path. I feel like this is, for me anyway, I feel like this is the most useless one. But uh, path, only send the cookie if the request starts with a specific path. If you have a site that's huge and has w w a lot of different paths for very different services on the same domain name, like buffalo.edu uses paths in their cookies quite a bit, then it makes sense because you might be going to the same server but for very different purposes, even on the same domain name. You can use the path directive to limit where those cookies are sent or when those cookies are sent. Then same site. There's uh, third party cookies, which are cookies from hosts other than the host that you're currently visiting. So if you go to say Twitch and you look at your cookies, there's gonna be a lot of cookies from Amazon because Amazon owns Twitch. So they're going to have a lot of their third party cookies so they, tra they can track you while you're on Twitch. Uh, most of the internet you go to, you'll see Google, Facebook, all kinds of social media sites that are tracking you through third-party cookies. Uh, when you're setting cookies, uh, you can set the same siteness, the strictness of when your cookies are set. The default is lax, which means your cookies will not be sent to third-party servers um, unless they're navigating to your site. So it's pretty good default, gives us a lot of good security, uh, security measures. Strict will only send that cookie for first party requests. So only send this cookie if you're visiting my site. And then none means send that cookie no matter what. It's just send that cookie all over the place, no matter what. Uh, so this is a, important. So when somebody is um, visiting, I gotta come up with an example. Uh, say you have an image hosted on your server and somebody on uh, another server, somebody building a website wants to use your image and instead of downloading the image and hosting it, 
they do image and then source and then dump the URL of where your image is hosted. Now, when they're visiting your site, they're going to get a uh, you're going to get a request from somebody visiting someone else's site for that image. This will control whether or not that request contains these cookies or not. And usually we don't want it to contain the cookies because uh, a more malicious thing is somebody makes an attack site, writes some JavaScript on their site that's going to make a request to, say, your bank and say, transfer all your money to me. You don't want that request to contain your authentication tokens and be authenticated as you. So the bank's going to say, don't send these tokens unless it's a first party request. Uh, that's more of the use case of it. And never trust your users. Uh, users can modify their cookies in any way that they want. Part of the testing procedures for the cookies is to actually edit one of the cookies, change the visit count, and then send a request again and make sure that your server, which is stateless, just treats that as the new visit count. Uh, so never trust your users. They can read and set their cookies. They can do whatever they want with their own cookies. It's their cookies. Uh, they can set cookies that you've never intended to be set. Uh, go into, into their JavaScript. If you've played with cookies before in 199, if you did, uh, did the web development, depending on which semester you took it, then you probably use JavaScript on the client side to set your cookies where in this class we're talking about setting cookies server side, uh, but you can set them client side and mess with your own cookies, create cookies, modify cookies, do whatever you want with them. So never trust your users. You can't trust what those cookies say because they might be modified by a malicious user. Um, with a big picture, is that slower done internet? Whoa. With a big size of picture, is that slower done the internet when you send bytes? I mean, it, it has to be sent over bytes. Like sending an, an image in an HTTP response, I mean, it's the same data that has to be transferred as if you like had a flash drive and you were downloading it. It's just sending over the internet instead of right through the copper. But it's the same exact bytes. Those bytes, you know, that is the file. Uh, are third-party cookie, cookies how you get targeted ads? Yes. That's how... So. If they're, like on Twitch, there will be JavaScript code that's sending information to Google, or not Google, uh, Amazon, I think they do Google too, but constantly sending information and saying, hey, this user did this, hey, this user did this. And those requests contain your tracking cookies so they know exactly who you are. Even if you're not logged into Twitch, they still know who you are because they can track that. Uh, they can see that, uh, not necessarily who you are, but that you're the same user who did this other stuff over on this other site because it's the same token. Yeah, and that's exactly how you get targeted. Like you go to one site and search for something, then you go to Amazon and you get those ads. They got your cookies. You put multiple directives on a single set cookie? Yes. Did this? Oh, I'm mad. My music didn't cut me off again. Oh man, it worked for the first two lectures. Like it, it works, and then just not for 312, what the?